let's talk about the books you ended up writing because all of this is connected. Even even the sport of golf, which we'll eventually get to, um, has some themes I think are very parallel to your life and the migrant story. So um, let's start with Mustang Miracle. Could you share with the audience uh, this nonfiction work that you'd written, um, eventually being turned into a, a film, major motion picture, right? And I'm pretty right. sure George Lopez had something to do with that. And I, I want to go into this direction. Let's help the audience understand what that nonfiction story was about. And then I'll bring in some parallels with golf. I want to talk about some metaphors here um, that I want to get your opinion on. Okay. In 2008, uh, we, were ha- we were having a reunion of the high school alumni from the school that was no longer uh, around because of consolidation. But we had reunion activities that included a golf tournament. After the tournament, we sat around in, in the hall um, and to get ready for a lunch and then presentation of trophies and that type of thing. The director, the guy that was running the tournament, got up and said, look, before I begin and present any trophies, I want to introduce to all of you the members of the 1957 golf team that won the state championship. And we all look at each other and say, what? We had a golf team in 1957, and we won the state championship? Why didn't we know about this? And at that moment, the light bulb went out of my head and said, that's the story I need to write. And I immediately realized the impact of that event, even though it had been suppressed in history all that time. Yeah. I understood the Mexican-American life experience and how difficult that was and, and the obstacles that as a group, as a people, we faced. I also understood the game of golf and how difficult that game is, especially in the, the 50s when you don't have the pro instructors, the, the, the up-to-date, the most modern equipment and, and supplies, all of that. You put that together and you recognize what a great feat and accomplishment winning the, the, the 1957 state championship in golf was for members of our people. And let's be clear, you know, um, this was a team of Mexican-Americans, and um, I believe they at one point were working on the golf course grounds, right? And 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 even had to to share equipment and like s- learn the game, and go out and practice on like dirt and sand, which more than likely improved their game when you get on a real golf course, right? I mean, you got to be were, really were, accurate if you're practicing on clay. Yeah. So there, there were caddies. Yeah, there were caddies and and at the country club a country club that uh, uh, unless you're white, you're not going to be allowed in and you're certainly not going to be allowed to play. But if you know golf, you understand that once you get into it, it's addictive. Uh, You get the bug and it won't let go. And that's what happened to the kids. Not only did they work caddying for other golfers, they saw the game and then they tried it themselves privately among themselves and realized this is fun, and we can do this. And they, among themselves, encourage each other. They, they shared the clubs together. Uh, when they realized they could not play on the actual golf course, they said, we're going to make our own. And they did, out of just playing ground. And, and How long did that take to make? The, now, Well, did they make just a few holes? Can you elaborate made, on that? They started out clearing out enough ground to just hit the ball from the one point the tee box to the green which, which wasn't a green it's just flattened flattened out ground with a hole in there 
uh, as a part three. And then they figured, well, you know, we could we could make it a little longer, clear more land and make it a little longer and get a part four. And then said, oh, we can make it longer, a little, just a little bit longer and make it a part five. And then you would just play it over and over and over again. Um, and that's how they, they honed their game. They practice on that. And, of course, they didn't have any gloves. They had clubs that had been thrown away or given to them. Uh, um, so they were well worn out and used. And Actually, that leads to the kindness of strangers. Yes. That was one of the themes. Could you explain where there was a healing process here too. Like there was something beautiful going on, even though there was discrimination, absolutely. But there was something amazing going on there and share that with the group. There were, there were individuals that they caddied for that were very fond of the caddies. Um, it transcended the, the, the common discrimination, ra racist attitudes of, of, of a people. Uh, and I would say they were the exceptions. They were people that uh, were just kind hearted to begin with, naturally good people. And, and they saw the boys and their interest in the game. So they said, okay, you guys can have these clubs or you guys can have these pair of old shoes that you can use. I'm sure you can use them or an old bag an old canvas golf bag. Uh, and they would give them to the boys uh, because they knew that they could use them and it was going to make them happy. So let's go back to when you, uh, well, did you say you were attending a, like a reunion at your, at the high school? Was that? It, it, yes. It, it was a reunion of, uh, of all the alumni. Can you explain not only your reaction to this historical news and, and not just your reaction, but everybody else's reaction, because no one seemed to know that this had ever happened. And I find that hard to fathom because how do you bury, how do you bury a story like that? Right? Like, I'd like to know more about that. Yes, I can tell you that I, I am, was not alone in learning for the first time about the 1957 golf team. And to make matters worse, when I went back to Del Rio to practice law, and by then I was playing golf regularly, and there was a standing Thursday afternoon golf game. A bunch of guys would go uh, and, and play, bet some money. There was anywhere from eight to 16 guys. And two of the guys that would regularly participate were J.B. Peña and Irán Valdez. Now, J.B. was the coach of the 57 uh, championship team. Irán Valdez was a man who convinced J.B. to recruit the caddies to form the high school golf team. And he would help financially with some of the expenses that they would incur for travel, for meals, and that type of thing. So he helped JB considerably. I'd play golf with those two guys <laughs> almost weekly. Not once. Not once did they ever mention. The Why? Hum I mean, you could say humble. And I could... I could maybe orchestrate a reason like what these individuals experienced was so special and private that maybe they didn't want to lose the sacredness of it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, but, but that's the, as far as I could, I don't, I don't have an explanation because frankly, even if people want to keep that a sacred secret, too many people knew. So do you have a theory on how this was suppressed? And what is it? I, I did. I, I do have a theory. I, I, unfortunately, I did not get to question JB or Iran Valdez because they both passed after I the story came up. But uh, 
I believe that since no one outside that small community <clears throat> made any deal of it, once the parade happened, once they were recognized in the high school, uh, because nobody else outside of the city made any deal about it, not even the other half of the city, the, the, the part of the city that, that was primarily white, they didn't make any, any deal about it. So I guess if the JB and, and Iramales and all the people realize, look, if if nobody other than us thinks it's a big deal, then it probably isn't a big deal. So just, just move on. But, uh, you know, it's beautiful. There's no stopping a story that's sacred, okay? I mean, like, it doesn't matter if nobody continued it. It continued on itself because it is an important story. And uh, w talk I more about your surprise, though. I mean, like, I want to, I want to know. I, that would have been shocking to me, having played with them and known them, and they they never bring it up. That would just shock me to learn it. And was this? Did you learn it after they had, had passed away? After JB and, and Iran Valdez had passed away, uh, but uh, the boys, I call them my boys because, you know, they're 70 uh, year plus year men and, and one of them is deceased already. But I, I got to to know all of them. Uh, they were they were around. And as soon as I read, I heard the story in my mind, I knew it was a look. Understanding Mexican American life was full of obstacles. You can't do a lot of things. You're excluded from a lot of things. You're excluded from golf, and a, a game you really love. Golf is very difficult. To succeed at it takes a lot of work and a lot of talent. To be able to have that talent and that desire to compete in a world and against a world that says you can't. And we're not going to allow you to do it. Yeah, and that's a recipe right there. And that's why I felt this is a compelling story. I got to write this. So I, I immediately uh, went to talk to the members of the team. And I asked them, listen, can I sit down with you guys and just talk about your experience? I'd like to ask you about it because I really would like to write your story. And they all look at me with a kind of a skeptical look in the face. And I couldn't understand why. Uh, and one of them asked me, says, really, you're going to write it? I said, yes. I says, why? He said, well, because we had a lady that, that talked to us a couple of years ago and, and that she was supposed to write our story and, and never did. I said, no, no, I can assure you. Look, I will make arrangements. We'll get together and, and I'll talk to you about it. And I'll ask you a lot of questions, get a lot of information for you. And then I'll sit down and write. I said, do you promise? He said, yes, sir, I'll do it. Okay. Because one of them was actually a, a teacher of mine in high school. I knew him. So there was uh, a bond of trust there already established from the past, right? Yeah. And I'm glad to hear that there is evidence that, there was a desire to get that story out, right? Because I think everybody who encounters it, it resonates. It's like a, it's like a human uh, experience that I think everybody on the planet at some point in their life, not on the same level, but even if you're wealthy, and uh, you've got the pressure of the family to meet that expectation. You you might be forced to do something in that family that isn't what you want to do with your life. Somebody is always challenged with that ultimate question. Should I stay true to my compass that I'm discovering is my compass or do I follow the compass that they're forcing upon me? Right. When do you resist? When do you fall in line? This is, this is something common to every person on the planet. I feel <laughs> well, I, I I did end up talking to the lady that, that was supposed to have written the story. And she told me, 
What did she, yeah, what'd she say about not writing it? She said, uh, I don't understand golf. I don't play golf. I don't know about golf. So I could figure out how to make it interesting for people to read about it. Uh, she missed the point, didn't she, right? This wasn't a story it, it, about it, golf. And I said, well, well, thank you for, for, for not doing it. That way I got the chances. Yeah, I'm glad you did it. I'm glad you – because – uh, and, and sure enough, I, I videotaped the boys, and I talked to them. Wow. And I – it was difficult at first to get them to open up because you're talking about thoughts – facts that were suppressed for many years yeah, yeah and and of course uh things were different in 2008 than back in 1957 they were now comfortable they they realized society had changed there there wasn't as much overt discrimination and racism now and then and and I think initially they felt guilty about saying some of those things that ha they experienced in the fifties. Yeah. Uh, so they hesitated, but I pressed them. <laughs> no, I, I and I think it's important because there there shouldn't be shame there either, right? I mean, when we're brought into the world, we only have control of how we react to it. Not everything is in our control, including our environment, right? And that's part partly that shapes us for better and for worse. And there's no shame in that. I think, I think the game of golf, although I, I must say it's an awful elitist sport uh, and, and that contrast alone, well, maybe that's judgmental of me, right? Perhaps it's, you'd it's, like to defend that it's not elitist, George, but it, I'll be open to that. Well, it is viewed as elitist because for many years, only white, wealthy men were allowed to play. They controlled. They would keep others that were not white, wealthy, and men from playing it. But that doesn't mean that there were not non-white, female people that wanted to play and could play because if you if you go back in history you you i found there was organizations comprised of mexican americans on the one end and you also had your african american organizations and some women that played the game in their own world in their own limited space that they were allowed to play in so the, it's it's a game that was not just loved and enjoyed by white wealthy men, but it's always been a game enjoyed by blue collar people, uh, non whites and, and women that have loved the game for a long time. It's just that they they didn't get the exposure, they didn't get the opportunities to play in the arenas that that white wealthy men played it and and were publicized and it's the spirit of sports in general it, it, it just i can't help but i would have expected this to be a story about boxing you know what i mean like that that's the the sport that seems that and soccer seem to be the sports that are most cherished so can you tell me now in south america uh and and, and mexico uh, is there a growth? Are you noticing a, a, a surge in interest in the sport of golf? Um, or is this still isolated and we just need to get the word out? No, no, no. There's there's golf activity um, all, all throughout the world and, and in South America. We filmed in June in, in Colombia. Uh, and you ask why? Why Colombia? There are golf courses in Colombia. Uh, I went there to play in a golf tournament in 2007. It's beautiful, isn't it? And in, in Medellin, Colombia, it was beautiful. And there was there was a lot of people playing, a lot of enthusiasm for the game. 
uh, and this was in 2007. And you see more and more in the PGA, you see guys from Peru, Bolivia, Paraguay, Colombia, that have, have succeeded on, on the U.S. PGA Tour. Well, that's interesting. Do you, do you think in some ways South America was ahead of the U.S. there in the interest in golf? Do you know? Like, were they getting into golf before Mustang Miracle happened? Uh, I have to say that it's been around a while. The, when I got to Colombia and I sat down with some of the members of the country club there, yeah, uh, they were second and third generation men playing the game. Their fathers, their grandfathers had played the game. So, yeah, I would say golf existed and was enjoyed by uh, people outside of the U.S. 